Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. Welcome back to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with me, Carl Fitzpatrick. Well, Louise Duffy was the mainstay of the Today FM broadcasting schedule for eight years. However, following her departure from the national station last summer, Louise decided to follow a different career path as a consultant with the communications clinic. Louise, you're a Mayo woman living in Dublin, but you now also have a Wexford sporting connection. I do. I suppose quite a recent sporting connection to Wexford, which wasn't something, I suppose, two years ago that I'd be expecting, I would say. But yeah, so my husband is Paul and he is the manager with the Wexford football team at the moment. So yeah, a new connection, but a great one. Uh, You know, he's having a great time with the guys down in Wexford and I think they're doing great things together. So it's lovely. I've yet to get down the N11 though and have a weekend down there. I suppose we were were looking forward to having some long weekends in in Wexford, but there's no games now so it's, it's kind of put the cry bottle that for us. Well as soon as the games resume Louise we look forward to welcoming you to Wexford. Now, Thank you yeah. From law graduate to AA Road Watch to Today FM presenter and now a consultant with the communications clinic it's been quite the journey but after you completed yes. the notoriously difficult FE1 law exams you decided to ditch that career of law. I did I did it's funny isn't it you know I suppose you know, I, I advise people on careers all the, all, every day in terms of what I'm doing now at the communications clinic. But one thing I think is really important and, you know, it's something I learned from my own experience is that, you know, you have to really go with your gut and you have to do what feels right to you. You're going to be working for so long. You're going to be spending so many of your, your precious hours you know, professionally and doing what you do for a living. Uh, it has to be something that feels right to you. And I, I studied for the FE1 exams and I was I was quite intent on, on becoming a solicitor, but I suppose very early on in, in, in that process, which is a pretty arduous process and it is intense and the exams are tough, I kind of, I, I started to feel like this wasn't the right thing for me. And actually I was living with a Wexford lady at the time, Kira Goggin from Wexford, and um, I remember her saying to me, I, I just came home from studying and it was the, the exams and the requirements, the study requirements were quite brutal. Um, but I had got the first four and I thought, well, go and get the next ones. And actually, I think actually it was actually at the point where I'd got all eight, but I just didn't feel right about it. And I was starting that process of trying to find an apprenticeship. And I remember her saying to me, just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to. You know, I think everybody owes it to themselves to, you know, if you can, maybe dip your foot in another in another pond and and see how that feels. And I suppose I was very young. I didn't have commitments at the time. I didn't have a mortgage or a family or anything like that. So um, went on another route, but with the safety net of, okay, these exams are, are valid for five years, you know, hoping that I wouldn't go back down that route. But, you know, it, it was, I suppose, a security blanket that I could fall back on that and, and go down that route again if um, the media thing didn't happen for me. Of course, you then went on to work with AA Roadwatch and Ian Dempsey was very much a supporter of yours and played an integral role in bringing you into Today FM. But Louise, yeah. looking back at your eight years at Today FM, what did you learn from your time there? So, I mean, oh, it was just so much fun there. You know, it was really... Um, uh, when I got that job, it was it was a dream come true. Absolutely, I you know broadcasting jobs are very limited. You know, there's only there's only a certain amount available in in Ireland, and you know to get to get a role there, I I just couldn't believe my luck. You know, and I was delighted with it, and really I suppose from a broadcasting perspective, learned so much because I was in the very early hours of the day. I was starting at five a.m. and I, I gradually worked my way through the schedule, but starting early, you know, you could make mistakes. There, there wasn't a great deal of people listening to in the morning so you could make some mistakes and you could learn you could learn the skills you know so that was great um, I suppose in terms of what I learned I, I suppose I learned my biggest lessons towards the latter end of my time in um Today FM and again when things kind of didn't really start feeling right and it didn't feel like a great fit and I kind of I suppose closed myself into a box where uh, I suppose in, in terms of my age I was grown out of it you know I was in there every evening chatting about Beyonce and Jay-Z and you know it was it was a lovely show but it, it became quite formulaic um, uh, but yet you kind of think you're doing the job that's your dream job so what do you do when when the the, the dream doesn't feel that good anymore um, so you kind of have to start looking. So I, I got to a point where I, was, I again, requiring another safety net in the event that 
radio wasn't an option for me anymore. And, and from there then I moved into the communications clinic and started consulting with them, you know. So how did the opportunity with the communications clinic arise and what appealed to you about a role which would be a significant departure from the airwaves? Yeah, it was a big move. Um, it was a, a big change from the airwaves. So what happened was really I I would have a relationship with, with the people in the, who run the communications clinic and uh, as with Paul, you know, so there was a friendship there. And and also I worked with Anton Savage and today FM and we all got on so well. So um, it came to a point where they were looking for new training consultants and suggested I might like to give it a try. And again, I was kind of just always had in mind that I need to have a plan B because in radio you're going from year to year and contract to contract and it's precarious. So um, an opportunity arose to to train with them. And from that first day that I said in front of, you know, the, some of the, the the veterans of training with the communication clinic, I learned so much about my my approach to communication. As a radio presenter, you're, you know, your propensity is to fill the air and you kind of think you have to keep talking. But listening is very important. And that's something I learned in the communications clinic. Listen to people, listen to what they're saying, listen to what they're not saying. Um, and th- from there, I started to train people and get results with people who would email and say, oh my God, I got the job and I'm delighted. And there was a real fulfillment in that. And it started to mean quite a lot to me, you know. Um, and it started to feel like I was doing something that had a lot of value, you know. So, so that made the, the move a lot easier and that uh, kind of, I suppose, I started to go down that route a little bit more. So typically, Louise, what does your role as a training consultant entail? Okay, so I'm very much focused with, uh, I'm very much focused on the careers element of the communications clinic. Now, the communications clinic do a great deal of other many things. Um, so, but I work, I work with, with clients on a daily basis um, who may have big interactions approaching in their, in their professional lives, be that a presentation, be that a job interview, and it's quite often a job interview. It could be a negotiation with, with a, a boss. It could be any form of communication that is a big one, that is um, a significant moment in their career. So people would come in, um, or when people could enter an office, but no, now we're doing everything via Zoom. But it's, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same uh, process. We meet our client, we sit down, we talk about what it is they're concerned about and it's a very experiential approach we then put them through a mock interview or a mock presentation we record that we watch back together and we see what they're doing really well and what it is that we need to work on and restructure and uh, bring them through so it has great value because almost immediately you can see the light bulb going off in somebody's head to say okay well I shouldn't be doing that or like I mean I didn't say anything I wanted to say there you know so People really do, um, there's great value in it. We also have a podcast, a brand new podcast arm of the business as well. We're, we're, we're producing podcasts for um, some corporate clients, you know, in terms of their own internal communications or um, perhaps for, for the, the, the great big world, you know. So that's just another thing that we're, we're offering at the moment. And Louise, from dealing with your own clients, what are the common mistakes that they make? I think that oh, it really does vary from, from client to client, but ultimately the, the key problem that I see on a daily basis is, is, is people failing to, to really outline achievements. You know, I think that people, uh, we have a very formulaic approach to um, an interview. We think we have to act a certain way and we think we have to say things in a certain way. Um, but ultimately it is just another form of communication. It is just another interchange, another dialogue. So people, people are very reluctant to say I'm I'm very talented at this or I have great achievements at the other and and to really outline what it is that they're good at Um, you know adhering to that job spec to pick the things that they do very well and tell the interviewer that this is something I'm well equipped at and here is an example of me doing that people really fail to um, to present evidence and instead speak generally. And then we're kind of not really saying anything if we're just speaking hypothetically and generally. You know, we need to present the evidence and the evidence ought to be your achievements. I suppose that's similar to a CV where lots of people will have one standard CV that they send out for every job, no matter what the title or what the responsibilities with the job are. But instead, if they look at the detail within the job spec and they then tailor their CV to suit that, it's far more effective. 100% and that's something that we do as well actually we do CV and application reviews so um, 
and and I think it's funny because um, our managing director Owen McDermott uh, mentioned there one day we were talking about that how it is vital to to tailor a CV to the job. To not do that is akin to you know throwing an engagement ring at somebody and saying, "Oh, listen, I tried to give that to another couple of women earlier, you know, <laughs> previously, but they didn't take it." You know, so you, you know it's it's almost it it, it it's a lot more respectful to really speak to the person that it, that that is reading the CV. You know. That's a good metaphor, I have to say. Now, there probably is a perception out there with listeners this morning that for those that are engaging with services like the communications clinic, that you have to be a senior executive, such as a CEO or a CTO or a financial controller. Is that actually the reality, though, Louise? Not at all, no. I mean, we see people from very young students, right up to graduates, right up to CEO level, very high exec level. And, you know, we can tailor a package to, to suit you know, whoever it is. So you could have a graduate come in and they've never done an interview before. So, you know, they need a specific kind of help. Or you could have a CEO who's wondering about the next move in their career. And and that would be a very different set of needs that they will have. And of course, negotiation skills are valuable to everybody at every stage in their career. And I know that's something as well that you assist job seekers with. What process do you take them through and what advice do you give them? Isn't that funny? Yeah, I suppose negotiation and, you know, the negotiation in terms of a salary or, you know, different different clauses in your contract is something that we're all incredibly um, uncomfortable about. We've all been in that position where you don't want to say, but sure, what are you doing it for if you're not, you know, everybody has their own, you know, drum to bang. So we really just take somebody through it, talk about, you know, how the objectives of the meeting. So if you're sitting down with your boss, what is it that you need them to understand? at the end of the conversation or during the conversation. So to really facilitate an objective-led communication so that you can really outline, you know, um, the requirements, you can really outline your points in a very, in a very rational, because sometimes these, these conversations can become quite emotive. Um, nerves make things, you know, heighten all emotions. So it's about really talking people through it and training them to, to really approach it in an objective-led fashion. And of course, increasingly, Louise, interviews are taking place through Zoom and through Skype. Yeah. What advice have you got for people around that? Because we've seen some incredible mess ups over the course of the last six yeah. months. <laughs> it's so funny. I suppose there, there are so many things. Um, I think that on a very practical level, make sure that your Wi-Fi is as is, is, is quick and as you know, effective as possible. You know, I actually just was in the car and had a Zoom meeting and I kept drop my Wi-Fi kept dropping and it's really jarring and you're not having the conversation you want. So you don't want anything like that to impact on your performance um, in terms of, you know, the angle that you're sitting in. We've seen our fair share of nostrils and forests over the last six months, you know. (laughs) So to make sure that you have the proper, um, your your front and centre and that the, the camera is, you know, facing you front on as opposed to looking up at you. Um, also, I've had people at very high levels where, you know, uh, there was one particular individual that I had for a Zoom meeting and I could see all of that person's holiday pictures behind and sure, like, you're going to be having a gawk at that while you're talking to them. So you don't want your, your background to distract from you. You don't want your background to be competing with you. You want to sit in front of a plain wall um, and, you know, you don't want any distractions. So we've all seen that clip of, you know, the little kids coming in um, when the guy was on Sky News. And Absolutely. that's the reality. I mean, that's happened to me so many times. I've been trying to organise my my clients around naps sometimes, you know, at the very start of lockdown when you're kind of just getting on top of working from home. Um, I have another individual who was doing a a Zoom session with me from her kitchen, obviously very near her washing machine, which went into full spin cycle. So she was shaking and the laptop was shaking and I could barely hear her. So very things like that you wouldn't actually think of, which could distract and which could take from your performance. Just get yourself into a quiet room, lock the door and sit in front of a white wall or any plain wall. And Louise, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted demand for your own services? quite um, significantly in that it's really busy now at the moment. I mean, you know, it always was and we, we were always juggling. Um, but now more than ever, we, we have we have a lot of clients coming to us um, looking to move. I think, you know, lockdown 
was a period of reflection for a lot of people. Thank you know, lockdown lockdown was tough for so many people, but for for many people who were at home and working from home and maybe realised that the commute doesn't suit them anymore, or that you know they weren't that happy going into the office every day. People are taking a look at things and, and maybe taking it as a time to to make some moves in another direction. Um, quite a lot of quite a lot of HSC roles, obviously. I mean, it's you know uh, they're 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 under such pressure at the moment. Um, and in general, you know, just just a lot of people taking this time to retrain um, and to kind of make make some positive moves in terms of their careers. So it's been really, really busy. And there's no doubt about it, those couple of months of lockdown really did give people an opportunity to think about where they are with their yeah. career. So you're yeah. talking to a lot of people that have gone through that point of reflection. So what mm. stages do you then bring them through? I think it's really important that you identify what area it is and start to make the move. I mean, now we, you know, with LinkedIn, we can connect very easily and we can start to have conversations prior to the prior to the official job interview. Um, when come, if someone comes in and they're, and they're looking to make the move, you know, it's really about pinning down where you need to go and what you need to do to put yourself in the best position. I think the person who's sitting in an interview who has put everything in place to make sure that they're the suitable person for that job, they've taken on the courses if it's a leadership position they've you know they they they've taken extra education to make them you know a better people manager or whatever it might be project management or whatever it is that they have you know they they have gathered the skills you know we we're not just born with these skills you have to you have to you have to learn and you have to educate and you have to get experience so you know your end goal might seem very far away but there are steps in the middle so we will guide someone through there you know one of the great things about your own background is that you've lived what you're telling people to do. So what's mm. next on your progression, Pat? Oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> it feels really busy at the moment now. But, um, you know, broadcasting is, is something that I, like, and you know, as a broadcaster, like, it's, there's a real buzz to it. And, you know, I w- w- be, have such fond memories of my time in Today FM, the people that I worked with, you know. So I I never wanted to close the door on that. So I, I started doing a podcast with Brian Thomas and we did like 20 really great profile interviews with founders of businesses. Um, and now, thankfully, with the communications clinic, we're about to start a, a, a podcast um, and we have some great guests lined up. And it's really going to be a how to of like, you know, the, the, the fundamentals that we teach people every day, be it, you know, um, impactful communication or active listening, uh, you know, getting your point across, whatever it is, speech writing, presentations. We're going to talk to a, a leader in that field. I'm going to talk to a leader in that field. So I, I'm I feel quite lucky in that I can still, um, I can still, you know, enjoy that side of broadcasting, albeit not live radio, which is, which has has its own highs, absolutely, but but via podcast. So, so that's the next thing really for us in the communications clinic and for me as well, you know. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Louise Duffy from the communications clinic, and I would like to thank Louise for returning to the airwaves once again this morning. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.